for coming today. I'm really excited to share with you a passion of mine, which is of all things building in public via live streaming on Twitch. I know it sounds a little weird, but I think by the end of it, you might, you might see why I enjoy doing it. And being someone who's really, really far off the Drupal Island, I haven't touched Drupal since like the five to seven days. Um, I figured I should give you a quick rundown of my background before we get into this. So I'm a developer who's had a really non-traditional journey into web development. Um, I have a very deep background in academia, and I spent mo most of my early programming career doing really high math scientific computing stuff on like big HPC clusters and, and things like that. Um, I've even worked in Fortran 66. 66 stands for 1966, and no, it wasn't very fun. Uh, but working in academia, working with all these you know, mathematical libraries, it's really where my love for open source software kind of took root. After leaving academia, I founded a startup where we were doing uh, high performance computing tools for carbon capture and sequestration and modeling how CO2 would be injected into these deep geological aquifers and it was an absolute blast. I was saving the world and then that entire industry imploded overnight. <laughs> which is, uh, it, it, it's a running theme, it's a running theme. And then I did a stint in FinTech for about five long, long years, which I don't want to talk about. And then I landed my current gig, which is developing a construction field logistics app for, a, it's like a medium-sized construction company. It does everything from dispatch to time cards to tracking materials and labor and everything out in the field. and everything in between. It's sort of like, C, uh, what is that, the CRM? Not CRM, I'm getting my acronyms mixed up. ERP, like an ERP light that doesn't do accounting. Um, we then bundle all this like web-based code into a web view in a mobile app so that we can distribute it. So if that sort of like web to native mobile app is something you're interested in, feel free to hit me up at any time during the camp here and I'm happy to talk about that sort of stuff as well. What's that written in? Uh, that's primarily written in TypeScript. Um, it's Angular, Ionic, and Capacitor are the three frameworks that we use there. And in my earlier years, I was a pretty competitive downhill skier, and it's one of my big loves in life, and I promise this is going like, to come into play later on in the presentation. Um, as I was saying before, for the past 20 or so years, I've done sort of web development stuff on the side as well. and. I was doing Drupal 5 to 7 way back in the day, so maybe I'm not completely off the Drupal island, uh, just out there, out there in the ocean a little bit. So the question of the day is why mail, I mean, why live coding? Um, I want you to close your eyes first. Well, no, you don't actually have to close your eyes. But take yourself back a little bit in time. It's a weekend in September of 2020. It might seem like last week, it might seem like 17 years ago, it was COVID time, so that's okay. The luster of work from home had worn off a bit and people were no longer turning on their video and Zoom calls. And how on earth did I bake nine loaves of sourdough bread last week? Now while I'd worked from home for years and I absolutely love my family, they're fantastic, like many others, I was starting to feel a little bit isolated. And meetups and conferences like this are such a great way for us as developers to connect, right? We can connect, we can exchange ideas. None of that was happening. And the work that I do now and was doing then was as a sole developer in a one-person company. So I was really missing that level of connection. And around that same time, one of my kids had started watching streamers on Twitch. And being the absolutely amazing dad I am, my 14-year-old will totally back me up on this. I think that's what the eye rolls mean. Uh, I had to dive in and figure out what he was watching on Twitch, right? I was like, I don't really understand all this watching people play video games, so I'm going to check it out. And one day, between the Fortnite and the Valorant and whatever, I noticed this category, science and technology. And I was like, what? That sounds kind of cool. And I clicked on it. And I saw at least a couple dozen people coding. And at first I thought, who the heck would want to watch that, <laughs> right? And I started looking at the view counts, and it turned out, when I checked, there were about 1,000 people 
watching people coding at the time. This is way back in 2020. And so I found one. It was this beautiful man here, bald, bearded, and building stuff. His name, by the way, goes by Bald Bearded Builder. I clicked on his stream, hopped on in, and within 15 minutes, I was absolutely hooked. Here was this guy building really, really cool stuff with a bunch of people in chat who were all developers who were cheering him on, trolling him, helping him out when he would get stuck. And it was just this amazing community around what he was doing. And it was a lot of fun to watch. I started looking through some more of the streamers and I found other streamers who were doing like HTML stuff with CSS wizard wizardry that I'd never seen before. I saw people developing C sharp games, you know, indie developers developing these games in C sharp. And most of them had these Discord servers, which is a lot like Slack. I don't know how many of you know Discord. It's very, very similar to Slack. And everyone would kind of come together after the streams and hang out. And it was just this wonderful, wonderful community. And I'd really found, like, in the midst of the pandemic, I'd found my people. It only took about a month before I was totally indoctrinated, completely hooked. And out of just like a YOLO attitude, I decided one day, you know what? I'm going to start streaming. And I hit the stream button, and the adventure began. And just as a side note, this is an actual image from one of my streams. So stuff can get like amazingly weird on stream. It's, it's, a, it's a whole lot of fun. So I was told by my seventh grade communications teacher that I had to have one of these slides in every single one of my presentations. So here it is. We're going to start by talking about the benefits of live coding, mostly in the context of the journey that I had and the benefits that I've seen. We're briefly going to talk about some of the little like gotchas you can get with live coding, which I haven't experienced a whole lot of them, but there's definitely a few things out there. And then we're going to try to build a simple live coding stream, and if the Wi-Fi will cooperate, we'll even hit the go live button. And, and no one will actually know if we hit the go live button, but we'll, we'll see. We'll see what happens. So benefits to streaming. We're going to start with the first one, and you heard me use the word quite a bit in the last couple slides, and that is community, connecting with other developers. other developers. Back in his 1999.NET keynote, um, Steve Ballmer, then the president of Microsoft, famously chanted to over a thousand live streamers, community, community, community. Actually, I think that was like developers, 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 but we'll, we'll just stick with community here a little bit. And my grandfather used to always tell me, Mark, it's not about reaching Twitch affiliate. It's about the friends we make along the way. By far the most obvious and frankly sort of the foundational benefit of live coding is the community that you build around you. As you stream, other developers are gonna jump in into your chat. Uh, they're gonna hang out, they're gonna start to offer you know, advice, some solicited, some not solicited, and they're gonna start to support you, and you them as well. While it seems like streaming may be a one directional kind of communication, it turns out that it very much is bi-directional. You're gonna get more coming from your community than you ever put out to it, which is a really neat experience to have. Uh, this is why it's really important to find communities you like in live streaming and figure out the things you like about them. And if you do decide to start live streaming, you wanna start to foster those ideas within your own community. Um, another thing you can do is find a Discord you like. I know that JD has done this. That kind of becomes your home Discord with other streamers. I've been attempting to do this as well with not as much success as uh, the one that the one the Discord that you're on. Yeah, but it wasn't uh, me, but <laughs> um, the other thing I'd really recommend is you get involved with other streamer communities, the ones that you like, before you start streaming. And the reason for this is one of the things that every streamer dreads is the zero view count, right? You spend all this time building your stream, got all these great ideas of what you want to do, and you fire it up, and you're talking, and you're looking at the camera, and that zero just stays a zero, and it can be really hard to get over that first sort of hurdle. And it, it makes sense. Because you're at the bottom of a list, you know, why is someone going to come watch you when the Primogen is pulling in 1,500 people? You know, there's, there's people have the people that they go to to watch. Because I've been involved in Bald Bearded Builder's community, I've been talking to him, I've been talking to others in this community who I knew streamed, 
and I'd been asking them, like, how do you do this? What do you stream? If I were to stream this kind of programming, do you think people would be interested? And they all got excited for me. So the first time I fired up my stream, almost immediately I had people in chat, mostly troubleshooting all the OBS issues I was having with the actual stream. I don't think I actually coded a line of code on stream for probably the first two or three times I streamed. It was all working out the bugs. But that community had kind of taken root and started. Let me see. Um, oh, yeah. And as I mentioned, that, that interaction, it goes both ways. One of the sort of, one, one of the biggest moments I had in streaming happened to me a few months ago, but the start of it was years ago when I first started streaming. When I first started streaming, we had this viewer who came in, and he was clearly new to coding. And he was asking a lot of very basic but very good questions in chat and was getting excited about the answers. And it was this really neat exchange that was going on. And all of a sudden, one day, they just disappeared. They stopped showing up to the stream. They stopped showing up in my Discord. And I started to be like, well, did, did I say something? Didn't hear from them for two years. And then a few months ago, they showed up in my stream chat. And they said, hey, I just want to let you know when I first found your stream, I was looking at gaming streams, and Twitch suggested your stream to me, which flabbergasted me in the first place. But I came in, and he said, it was so much fun watching you code, and it was infectious. And after a few weeks, I decided to start looking at boot camps. And he had enrolled in a boot camp, and he was letting me know that two years later, he was getting his, he'd just gotten his first job in software development, and he finally felt like he had a profession that he loved what he did. And I'll tell you, there were, someone was cutting onions next to me <laughs> at my desk when I was hearing this, you know. So you get this amazing, amazing connection with other streamers. Now the second benefit of live streaming is mentorship, or as I like to say, standing on the shoulders of, wow. So I asked Midjourney to generate some imagery for me here. And this is the result of a computer programming standing on the shoulder of a giant. And I don't think it exactly got it right. Let's try it. Oh, good lord, that's even worse. Um, let's, let's, let's get simple. There we go. So we're going to stand on the shoulders of giants. When you're streaming, you don't know who's in your stream watching. There's a lot of so-called lurkers. I will say over my time streaming, and you're going you're gonna to hear some stuff here which confirms this, I've expanded my professional network in a way that no programmer in a basement in Rosemount, Minnesota should ever have been able to do. Um, imagine if the maintainer of the web form module showed up in your stream, or even Dries. It's that sort of stuff that can happen. I can distinctly remember one day, about a year after I'd started streaming. Now, I stream my day job work a lot of the times, and I use Angular and all these other frameworks, and I was using this NPM package that is a big, big NPM package, like half a million downloads a week big. And I was struggling with something complicated with it. I was trying to get the, you know, the code to work, and it wasn't working right. All of a sudden, a new chatter pops up. And I'm looking at the name, and I'm like, I know that name. And the new chatter seems to know everything. Like, well, try this. Boom, it works. Try it. it was the original founder and maintainer of that package who had seen in my title in the stream that I was using it, jumped in the stream. He hung out in the stream, the whole stream. He came back the next stream, showed up in my Discord, and now he, we, we've got a lot of people who do the same sort of stuff in my community. He hangs out in my Discord and helps people out all the time. It's amazing the kind of connection you can get. In another case... I started doing a thing, and I got to do more of it, where I wanted to interview people in tech on my stream. And so I was on Twitter one day, and there's this framework I use a lot, and there's this individual who makes the framework, who made the framework, big, big guy in tech, right? And I decided I'm just going to send him a DM. I won't hear back, but I'll see if he wants to come on the stream. Three hours later, I get a response. And I will quote it here. It said, absolutely, I love watching your stream when I can catch it. And then I was like, okay, we're not doing this. <laughs> you know, it, was, it was like terrifying. But it just goes to show you, you never know who's watching. And even with those lurkers, as you reach out, you can expand your professional network in 
absolutely surreal ways by putting yourself out there and building in public. When you start building in public, the people who made the things that you build, they're interested. If they see it, a lot of them will come watch and you can connect with them. So the third, stream chat is the ultimate rubber duck. If there's anyone in here who hasn't heard about rubber duck debugging yet, you're about to hear one of the like trade secrets of programming. You take a rubber duck, doesn't necessarily have to be rubber nor a duck. You put it on your desk, and when you run into a problem, you talk to that thing. You explain the problem you have. You explain the code that you're trying to get to work. And it turns out that the process of converting our thoughts into speech activates different parts of our brain that are better at solving different problems. And many times, just the act of doing that, you can actually come up with the solution to something that's been driving you crazy. It's very similar to when you go to like Stack Overflow. Oh wait, Stack Overflow is not a thing anymore, is it? Now it's all ChatGPT. You go to ChatGPT, you start typing in the question, and halfway through typing in the question, you're like, oh, I got it. I mean, has anyone else had that experience? Yeah, I mean, it, it happens all the time. So Stream Chat plays a really similar role. Most of the time when you're streaming code, you're gonna be narrating what you're doing. So you're actually rubber duck debugging. You're going to be talking about the line of code you're writing, what it's going to do. Maybe you'll start talking about that mythical time in the future when you'll be able to refactor that line of code that'll never come. I don't know, but you, you go through that process of talking about the code, and you don't necessarily expect your audience to talk back to you until they do. For example, you might be like really screwing up validating a phone number, and oh, you could validate that with a regex. Okay, Mr. Smarty Pants Duck, I don't know regex very well. How, what expression would I use? Do you know? Of course you know the expression you'd use. And it comes flying back to you and it's, well, thank you very, very much for that. You know, of course, chat then is going to troll you a little bit. But I also saw a tweet once that the best way to get a programming question answered is to go on Reddit, post the question, make a new account, and post a clearly wrong solution to that question, and people will come out of the woodwork to correct that wrong solution. So when you're writing a wrong solution on stream, you're gonna know about it real quick. You gotta have a little bit of thick skin, but it actually can be very, very beneficial in the whole process of developing software. So live coding is also a fantastic way to learn new languages, new domains, and to build the kinds of like crazy experimental stuff you've always wanted to build but didn't really have a, a, an excuse to go build. As your community grows, so does the breadth of knowledge that your community has. I've got people in my community that are absolute Angular experts that contribute to Angular core. I've got people who have been doing embedded coding before, since before I was in school. Um, I've, I've managed to gather this community of a lot of my interests because of what I put on there and bring that expertise to me. On stream, I've learned how to program with ESP32s, which are these cool little boards that have Wi-Fi and Bluetooth on them. I've learned how to work with Raspberry Pis, which I'd never done before. I've learned how to write shaders for GPUs, which is something I would have never thought I would have done. And my latest work has been building a new plugin for OBS to do blur filtering on live video streams, and it's been out for a week, and it's got over 2,000 downloads already, which blows me away. I would have never thought a hobby or something I wanted to do could get to that level, right? And so much of that is because of this community effort of learning on stream. You've got me, the streamer, who's sort of the example learner. You've got the experts in, in your community who are advising you and helping you. But then the great part is you've got other people in your community who are learning right alongside you. And so it's this really nice, I guess, symbiotic relationship amongst all three. And the person who was the teacher last week might be the learner this week. It's, it's a really neat thing. And one little secret is your viewers are just as excited about your colossal failures as they are about when you have success. So it makes it a very, very safe environment to learn in because no one's judging you, right? They're expecting things to go wrong, they're expecting things to go right, and everyone's excited about that learning process. 
And exploring, it's fun. I'm sure you all can remember those moments you had in your programming journey. Maybe it was when you first wrote your first Hello World program and you saw the characters come up on the screen. Maybe it was the first time you centered a div vertically and you didn't have to look it up. I mean, I, whatever it is, we all have those moments that are just like, you know, they just blow our minds and it's absolutely amazing. And it puts this huge gust of wind into our sails. But it seems that unfortunately, the longer you program, we, we gain more skills, maybe we get a little bit jaded, those moments start to come less and less. And it's a real shame because I think that's why a lot of programmers eventually start to, to burn out. Live coding, exploring, building new stuff, it gives you those moments. One example is a few years ago when I was starting to work on embedded programming, we got the eye going across here, uh, I built this RGB LED matrix, wired it all up through Twitch's APIs, and Twitch chat can send emotes and messages to it. And the first time I saw this thing light up and something go across, it was one of those moments. And to this day, it is my favorite of all the redeems I have on my chat, and every time I see it light up, I get that little tinge of excitement, because it's cool. It's cool, I built this thing, and someone else across the world is controlling it. I mean, pretty sweet stuff. And then there's the skiing, right? So I said I love to ski. So we spent a bunch of uh, streams building telemetry software that runs on my phone with a whole like thing with chat to do text-to-speech in my ear, and I built a whole IRL streaming rig with a GoPro, and the result is live streaming skiing with how, my altitude, how fast I'm going, and it's an absolute blast. So in the winter, I try to get a half a dozen or so of these streams in. I'm whooping and hollering here, looking like a crazy person on the slopes. But it's an absolute blast. So you can have so much joy out of streaming when you start to link these things together with the other things in your life that you love to do. Now we're going to do a total 180 here. Does anyone know what I'm getting at here? It's David Bowie, but pressure cooker, right? So, under pressure. <laughs> so, one of the sort of juxtapositions of live coding is you're always under a little bit of pressure, right? Because there's people watching you. They're watching every keystroke you're putting in. On some of my bigger streams, if I've had a big raid, I might have, I mean, I've had up to like 1,200 people while I'm coding. And no matter how you spin it, you feel that pressure. But again, it's a safe environment to feel that pressure. So as developers, we all run into these situations where we've got time constraints, you know, a bug in production that we've got to fix, and we feel that pressure. I've noticed since I've started live streaming that I get less stressed in those situations. I get to a solution quicker. It, it's just all over better for my mental health because I've like prepared myself for it by putting myself under a little bit of pressure all the time when I stream. And this leads me to the final benefit I'm gonna get into today. Live coding has slowed down my coding in all the best ways. I was talking about this whole idea of narration, and that slows down how many lines of code come out of your fingers. And when I started to do this, I was I was streaming my professional work, and I, I was like, you know, I'm not putting out as many lines of code as I would in a normal day. And I started to get concerned. So I started to track my productivity. And what I ended up finding really, really surprised me. I was putting out fewer lines of code, but the quality of my code was much, much better. And the number of bugs in my code was much, much lower. And I was getting through issues in, you know, in my GitHub repository across the board much faster than I was before. Like 25, 30% faster. So this whole idea of slowing down to go fast has a whole lot of merit and streaming forces you to do this. The other thing that I noticed is this whole dialogue in my head after a year or so of streaming started to creep its way into my coding off stream too. So even when I wasn't streaming, my brain was still going through the whole motion. And so my programming improved overall, not just when I was on stream. 
Now, I painted a pretty, pic you know, a pretty nice picture of what streaming can do for you, but it definitely isn't for everyone. Um, personally, I've not run into too many downsides um, in terms of live coding, but there's a, few, there's a few to be aware of. The first is it absolutely can be a distraction. I've had days where I've wanted to get X, Y, and Z done on stream, and I've gone into stream and chat had other ideas, and I was not in the mindset to keep things on track. I mean, chat always has other ideas. Most of the time I can keep, you know, keep on the rails, but every once in a while it, it gets kind of hard. Um, so being a one-man shop, as I was saying, I track my productivity, how many issues I'm getting through, how many features I'm putting out, and to date, my very productive streams far, far outweigh the unproductive ones, but I need to be aware of it, because if that ever switches, I've got some decisions to make in, in terms of my professional development here. Second, streaming takes a lot, especially when you first get started. I mean, you're trying to monitor chat, you're trying to monitor a video broadcasting software, you're coding, you have all this pressure down on you, right? And so sometimes it can start to feel like a little bit of a chore, and one of the things that they tell you when you start streaming is to build your community, above all, stream with a consistent schedule. Pick whatever number of days a week and stream at the same time on each of those days. Some days you're going to be scheduled to stream and you just don't want to do it. Listen to yourself. Don't force yourself to do it, especially early on. Um, you're going to burn out if you don't. My community has been so supportive of me needing to take some time off a of stream, even take like a month off when, when I need it, and they're there when I return. Even early on, missing a stream, people go find another streamer to watch for the day, and they're not gonna forget about you, especially if you're really building your community by being engaged with your viewers, they're not gonna forget you. So you, you really don't have to worry about that aspect. And finally, Building and maintaining a community is also a lot of hard work. It's very rewarding work, as I hope I've illustrated so far, but it is hard work nonetheless. So this folds nicely into that whole burnout thing. Don't expect perfection out of your community, but at the same time, you can't let things get out of control, because once they get out of control, it's way, way harder to get the cat back into the bag. So now, let's build a live stream. We're gonna start off with what hardware do I need to stream? And the answer is to get started, you probably already have what you need. You can stream with a laptop and a laptop webcam and a laptop mic. It works perfectly fine. If you're thinking about bumping up a notch, right? You, you stream for a few days and you decide, hey, I wanna, I wanna like, I wanna make this a hobby that I'm gonna do regularly. I would say, argue that audio is the best thing to start upgrading first uh, because people aren't looking at you necessarily, they're looking at the code and they're listening to you. So they're always hearing your voice and a bad mic can be hard to listen to. Um, so some options, I am a big fan of these USB condenser mics that are fairly inexpensive, you know, 50 to 150 bucks for a good one. The Elgato Wave mic is a fantastic mic. Um, you can do so much now in processing in software. Um, you can also go with these dynamic XLR setups and they range from like, by the time you get a uh, input and you get a mic, you're looking at at least 200 bucks to just stupid amounts of money. I mean, there's streamers with like $8,000 audio setups and they don't sound very different from the $150 USB condenser mic. So it's, it's definitely diminishing returns. Uh, the next is lighting. So once you have your webcam on you, uh, lighting will play a bigger role than the actual quality of the camera at first. So you can even start off with like some of these LED um, Home Depot work lights. I've, I've seen some streamers that have them like, they got like clamps and stuff on their desk and they're just lighting themselves up with a work light that they got for 30 bucks at, at Home Depot and it works just fine. Uh, you can start to then get into the kind of dedicated lighting and, you know, I think my lighting setup, which is a pretty good lighting setup, is like, it's like 150 bucks. But again, it can go astronomical with lighting if you get super, super serious about it. And then finally, upgrading your video. So a great option you've got is probably in your pocket right now. The cameras on phones are amazing. And there's Android apps and iOS apps that allow you to use your camera as your webcam. 
I use my iPhone as like a secondary camera. I do these uh, projects with like soldering and stuff, and I've got a helping hands thing, and I just put my phone in it. And the video that comes out of it is absolutely gorgeous. Uh, you might want to consider like a higher quality webcam. It's not worth getting the, the junky ones. They're, they're junk. But 100 to 200 bucks for a high quality webcam, and you know, you're going to be in a pretty good place. And then you can go, you know, the way that I went. Don't, don't, tell, don't tell Mrs. Mark. Um, like a mirrorless camera or a DSLR with a decent lens. You know, you can get things used that work pretty well, where you can get much, much higher quality than the other two for, you know, three, five hundred bucks. Or the sky's the limit. I mean, there's streamers out there with, like, 4K video stuff from Sony that costs more than I make in six months. You know, so it, it can get really stupid on the video side. But you don't need that. So work your way down the list. So what else do I need? Well, you're going to need some software. I would suggest OBS, which is what we're going to do a quick demo of here in a moment. You can go to obsproject.com to get that. Uh, you need a code editor or IDE if you're live coding, obviously. It can be Notepad or a lot of these streamers. The diehard ones are using like Vim in a terminal and doing all the key and I, I, I don't get it. But I, I happen to use uh, Visual Studio Code a lot. I think it's a great editor. Um, We'll see in OBS, you can just literally bring the window in as a source and just pop it right up in your stream. Um, and it's good to have some hopes and dreams when you're streaming and definitely have an ability to laugh at yourself because stuff's going to go wrong. And if you're, if you're not the kind of person who can handle stuff going wrong in public, it might not be the thing for you. So you have to have a bit of a sense of humor um, to, to, to do the streaming thing well. Okay, let's see if we can... Oh, I forgot yeah, this... one thing. What's that? I forgot one thing. What's that? The signal... Oh, how much... Uh... Oh, yeah, so in terms of... Uh, in terms of bandwidth, you know, I'm on... Um, I've got like 20 meg up, and it's okay. You can get away with probably like 6 meg up if you go like 720p in a lower... I guarantee you my DSL does not do that. Okay, okay. Well, that, that makes it a little bit tough then. Um, okay, we gotta. I gotta figure out how to switch this now. Okay, so OBS. You go to obsproject.org or POM or whatever it was, and you download the thing, right? And one of the things you want to do after you download is go into your settings, and well, we'll just see here. In settings, there is. I believe it's under stream. The ability, you'll see a connect account here. I've already connected the account. That's to connect to like your Twitch account or your your YouTube account or what is it, Kick or whatever that other one is that no one codes on Kick, so probably not that one. Or it might be a good opportunity. I don't know. I don't know. And this is what you'll be presented with: an open, fresh, new OBS. If you saw my OBS, it's not like this. <laughs> um, so we have scenes. The, the basic idea is you have scenes and you have sources that can be in those scenes and can be shared between scenes. So let's just start by making a quick talking scene. So I'm just going to right click here and rename this one to talking. And then under your sources for the scene, you would just go ahead and click plus. We went on an audio input capture and we'll just call that mic. And then you would select whatever microphone you want. I guess we'll use my MacBook Pro and not my phone in my pocket. And then we're going to add a video source. So a video capture device down here. And I'm just going through this to show you, we'll call this webcam, show you how simple it is to get something basic set up and running. The device then will be the high HD camera here. And there we go. Hello, I'm, I'm here. Uh, we'll just click OK. And now we got a talking scene, right? We've got my mic, we got my face cam. Now let's make a coding scene, right? Because what we want to ultimately do is live code. So we'll make a new scene here, and we'll just call it coding. And under coding, uh, let's go ahead and add again our, where did it go? Audio input capture. And here we want to add an existing, because we already set up our mic. And we want to go ahead and let's add our webcam. And one of the cool things about it 
just like in like Photoshop or whatever, you can grab and, oh my gosh, I, I don't like the new Apple mouse either. <laughs> you know, put, put your webcam down in the corner because that's what all the streamers do. You always put it down in the corner. And now we want to get code on screen. So let me make sure I've got an open uh, VS code. Yep, there we go. And so there's different ways you can do this. You can capture your whole monitor or you can capture individual windows. I'm just gonna do an individual window capture here. Uh, you'd go ahead and hit plus again on this scene and then you would go to, where is it? There's screen capture. Oh, does the Mac not do window capture? It does. It does. I think it's the back screen. Yeah, maybe you can select a window. Oh, here we go. You can select window capture. I guess on the Mac, you have to select display capture and then select your window. On Windows, there's actually a window capture option. So uh, my streaming PC is a Windows PC. Um, and then you would find one of the, in one of the many windows here. Let's just grab, I don't know, maybe that looks like a VS Code window. And then you would resize, of course, the window to fit whatever your canvas is. In this case, it's going to be something like that. We, we don't need to show the whole thing, do we? Um, and then you can, like in other software, we can drag this behind the webcam, and boom, we've got, we've got a stream ready to go here. We can code. Normally, you'd have more room than I have on the laptop here, so you might have your coding window over here. I've got a big 4K monitor, so I got my coding window on one side and my OBS window on the other. Um, but you can literally tab over to your window here and start typing, and it's going to be going through OBS and out to wherever you're streaming. And I'm just realizing that you guys wouldn't even see. I mean, all you do to start streaming is click Start Streaming. I don't know if it's actually going to connect. I guess it's going to try to connect. But with that, does uh, does anyone have any questions? So where does your chat show up? So chat will show up. Um, oh, oh, I tried to quit OBS. On the right side, I had a chat window right there. OBS allows you to dock Twitch chat right in OBS. There's also other apps that you can use. Well, it really doesn't want to quit. Uh, there's other apps that you can use to also show chat in a different window. There's some really neat apps where you can click on like a chat message and it'll show up on your stream, stream like pulled out so that you can address questions someone's asking. There's there's all sorts of neat One thing things I you can do really with that. One irritating with Twitch is that the chat goes by so fast you really don't have a chat. Yeah, it, it depends. I found that in... Um, Live like live coding sessions. That's not so much the case. Oh, okay. It's, I, I got things like there's fifteen hundred. Yeah, and it, all saying, Hi, it, how are you it, doing? it gets when it gets to that point. There's just nothing you can do. I think. Did you have a question? Yeah. Is is the Twitch chat arriving in OBS because you've connected your account? Yes. Okay. Yep. It's because I've connected the account in the settings, and then it gives you these docs. So you can get a doc of like the stats of the upload rate to Twitch, and it'll show you if you're dropping frames and that kind of stuff, as well as your list of chat, and then your list of events that happen. So like if someone subscribes to you or does bits or any of these other things that Twitch does, you can see those events pop up as do well. They, do they still have kind of those veneers over uh, what was Because uh, you could make like an aesthetic frame. Oh, yeah. your stream. They still have oh absolutely yeah there's there's websites where you can download that stuff or if you're crazy like I am you make GPU shaders that do it all for you yeah. so there's there's all sorts of things you can do when you start streaming one of the like rites of passage is that you need to build a chat bot and you need to build something to control your overlays and then you go crazy and you make clones that come out behind you that, that's on my stream but you know it's one of the really fun things about live code streaming is for your first like six months, you've got content ready to go. And so many people will come watch you build a chat bot, even though they've watched 40 other streamers build a chat bot, people just love watching it because they get to type commands in chat and boom, things pop up on the screen, right? And so people love that interaction and love seeing that development happen. So, yes? Is there any uh, capability of doing a collaborative. Right? Oh yeah, yep. So you can have one person take over the screen and write code and somebody else take over. And... Yep, 
Yep, so there's, um, you can use in Visual Studio Code, there is live share where you can have two people remotely editing within an editor. Um, Twitch also has built-in tools now where you can bring someone else's webcam and voice in so you can have like your webcam in one corner and theirs in the other and the two of you are fighting it out for who gets the code. Yeah, sort of, sort of. It would, oh, I, guess, I guess we've lost the source. Oh, I'll just tap that. To, Oh, did your computer go to sleep? It, it did, yeah. <laughs> so, um, but so yeah, it's um, there's there's a lot of different ways you can interact on chat uh, or in stream. That's how I would have like people come on my stream. I've had a few streams where I interview people about like what they're doing in tech and stuff, and they just go into the Twitch app and through the browser grabs their webcam and mic and sends me a signal that I can then set up as a new source in OBS and just put right alongside me so we can almost look like we're in the same room. Yeah? How does one stay in contact with you? Uh, the, I, can, I can give you my details afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> so they were on the slide, but the, the, the machine went to sleep. So It's finite singularity is my, my Twitch handle. And then uh, a shortened version of that without the last two vowels for my Twitter, because Twitter didn't like the long name, but I can I can write it out it's for called you. Called X now. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it'll never be called X. No. <laughs> yes, JD. Um, not a question, but Nutty just released that video. Oh, he did. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll be watching that in a little bit. <laughs> Are you watching it? Does no, it I'm not up? watching it yet. <laughs> yeah. But any other questions? And obviously, during the set, you know the unconference up here. If you want to come chat about anything streaming, I am thrilled to talk about it. So, yes. How do you overcome the moments where you're just you're working, mm -hmm. and it's just like this is stupid. Like you're in the middle of something, and it's like um, all of a sudden Twitch wants to stop working completely, yeah. and then you hit a bug with the code. What yeah. are your methods of recovering from those? Missteps. It, it, it missteps. depends on how many missteps there are. I, I've rage quit a stream before. I had one where just nothing was going wrong, and I was just like, nope, <laughs> we're done. You know, so that has happened. But I think a part of it is cultivating that community that's supportive. So I've noticed a lot of times when things are going wrong, my community isn't piling on especially if they can see that I'm actually truly getting frustrated, people will start being supportive of, you know, okay, you've got this. Have you thought about doing this? You know, and it, and it, it changes the whole tone of things. Um, and part of it also is I have times where I just tell Twitch chat, I'm not looking at you for the next five minutes. i got to figure this out. And they can type whatever they want, and I've warned them I'm not looking at chat, so I'm not going to respond, and I just go heads down. I also have times when a client calls and I've got to be looking into something for five minutes that I can't show on stream, and so I've got filters and stuff that go up and black out the screen and chat just knows they can chat and do whatever and I'll be back in a few minutes. So um, it, it's a lot about that community cultivation and it's a lot about the ability to just say, sorry chat, I got to heads down focus on this for a few minutes and people seem receptive to that. Yes. So you said you stream your work stuff. Yeah. How do you know what you can stream and what you shouldn't stream yeah. for your work stuff? Yeah. Well, so it's it's all mine. I own all the IP to the stuff, to the code. So I, I'm comfortable showing all my code because it's a six-year project, and if someone grabs some little bit of code out of it and they're able to reproduce the whole thing, good for them, right? <laughs> um, in terms of, like, data and stuff, I've been very intentional since I started this project before I was streaming to basically take production data, bring it in as if it was real data, and then I scrub it so that it clearly looks like fake data, like a foreman's name becomes George Foreman kind of a thing. So I know immediately when I'm looking at, I, I originally did it so that I would know immediately when I'm looking at the data that I'm working on dev and not production. Because there have been times where I've started doing it and I'm like, oh my god, I'm on production, I don't want to, I'm in the wrong window. Right, uh, So that worked out great for streaming because there's no sensitive information. Everything's made up in terms of the data that I show. So I've been very careful to just say anything that's client data, I'm not going to show on stream. Anything that's not client data, it's fair game because I own the IP to it and I'm okay with showing it. So I'm, I'm very fortunate in, in that regard. Yes? Have you ever accidentally given away personal information on stream? <laughs> I, okay. When we were doing that telemetry data thing, 
I had a debug window up that was showing my current lat and long position from my phone for two hours at the bottom of my screen without noticing it. I also, one time, was joking about a IRL snail mail Nigerian prince letter I got. And I was like, look at how stupid this is. And I held it up, and my name and address was right at the top. So I immediately stopped the stream, deleted the VOD, brought the stream back online, and was like, you all didn't see that. So, do so, you also have like a blur filter? I do. I do. In fact, the filter that I've been developing for a while is a blur filter. And I, I, have, I have a button I can press on my stream deck that just blurs everything out and make sure, make sure no secrets get by, except when I accidentally literally hold them up to the camera like an idiot. <laughs> Anything else? Well, thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoyed the talk. It was a lot of fun putting it together for you and sharing with you. Thank you. Thank you.